मिस्टर जैन प्रसाद डी जी आई डी एस ए फ्रेंड्स द टॉपिक इन वन सेंस इज टॉपिकल इट्स द बज वर्ड टूडे स्पेशली पोस्ट दी पैरिस अटैक्स एंड द सैन बर्नाडिनो इन कैलिफोर्निया अटैक्स But I think what we really need to do, because I know there's going to be detailed sessions on many of the items, and I'm therefore going to talk on some key issues. Who is a radical, and what does radicalization mean? I think all of us, in one sense, uh, we've been radicals in our life at some point or the other. We've always been the element of sometimes frustration at the status quo and so on. We want to do something. I know lots of top economists in India who actually left Saint Stephen, joined the Naxal. movement etc and then they came back when they realized that you know it, it involves also cutting of throats they thought it was all idealism reform etc which is there in the youth so radical ideas are all is there is part of our what shall i say it's a part of any multicultural democracy etc radical ideas will always be there as somebody mentioned uh, during the tea break all progress has taken place through radical ideas it's not taken place through status quo so we have to be very careful and i think if you look at the literature on radicalization or definition of radicalization there is any number from a to z of what is defined as uh, radicalization for the purpose of the subject in terms of growing security challenge i think we have to be very clear what we mean by radicalization we are not talking of somebody who has got radical ideas or who's got we are really looking at people who are shall i say a process by which they are thinking goes to what shall i say extremes of taking violent action and or they will look at people who are also looking at curbing in one sense freedom of expression speech etc thinking these are the two things which we really have to worry about in our democracy one because we don't accept violence as a means of uh, resolving our problems and we believe that there is a freedom of expression which everybody has the right you don't you don't you can everybody can speak out their views you may not agree with it but he has the right to speak out so long as as you said he is not inciting somebody to violence or you are creating you know communal hatred or whatever it is you are not doing that so if we are clear on that definition in one sense of keep that as a parameter not the general uh, radicalization then you will find that in india we've had this radical type of thought which has been coming from you know you've had people right from the telangana agitation which started in the late 40s the left wing radical movements which right down to the maoist movement where again you you see the two kin features violence as an instrument and lack of freedom expression opinion you cannot express any thought other than what the maoists want otherwise you will be killed and that is where i think the radical thought in that sense and i would like to define that there are other expressions of radicalism which has come say in the kashmir in jammu and kashmir youth we say are radicalized we we are worried about their alienation and so on those are slightly different so long as the youth are you might call it alienated they are frustrated there's lack of economic development okay no problem it's something which you have to solve it's part of our democracy's right to resolve those issues it's only when they take to violence or they say that there is a particular only one way of thinking or one way of acting that is where you have the cause of concern and this is very very important for us to understand we've seen uh, sick radicalization the 70 late 70s 80s and so on and so forth again sense of grievance frustration not able to and i think one of the most important factors which has come about in all these areas whether it's international context is one i'll come to slightly later because we are looking at it from the indian security challenge where again the sense of grievance is built up and the counter story or the counter narrative doesn't come out to say what has happened what has not happened you find that it it happens any 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 small issue which comes up and so important because I, i just want to give a small example of your one rack one pension for the armed forces 
it's such a simple issue if you don't handle it in the proper manner there's a lot of mistrust and shall i say confusion which spreads right throughout the and people start there's a grievance grievance right grievance alleged grievance how right is it and so on will also all comes in therefore the communication aspect of this is extremely important when you look at solving the issue of what i would call as uh, the counter radicalization strategies india in one sense is very fortunate because one of the reasons why radicalization in one sense hasn't spread so uh, in the context in which i am saying it is partly because of our family and our communities our family and community structures are so strong that people don't go to that violent extreme of saying that i will only resort to violence except in certain cases which have come and also that i will not allow other people to have an alternate expression or an alternative thought you never find any you find uh, an indian who has gone to syria or something wanting to ring back to his father and mother and say you know bring me back you will not see a french uh, any of these people ringing up their mothers or somebody and saying no i want to come back i want to be rehabilitated you know i don't like this etc part of the reason is again this family structures which we have our community is so is one sense still strong we don't know how it's going to evolve as the new technologies and the new uh, internet and takes over more and more and the family ties get weakened but that family tie and the community is so strong that that is in one sense going to be the pillar of india's shall i say counter radicalization strategies is on the pillar of the family and the community if you look at in one sense islamic radical radicalism which has taken place in india it's again been a slow process and it's and i have put it as it's unique the way it has evolved is different in different parts of india itself how it has evolved in up from the formation of simi in 1977 that's one level how it has evolved in kerala where state where i come from where when I, when i grew up in college and beyond even when i was in the ias as collector i could the meeting meeting like this in the collectorate conference hall i could not make out a muslim from a hindu or a christian all wore the same dress nobody had beard nobody had burkhas nobody had uh, uh, hijab and so on and so forth the muslim uh, ld clerks and section officers and deputy tahsildars all wore the same dress today is quite different you can make out very clearly therefore the differentiation has come how it has come etc that's one aspect up itself i remember i think uh, it was just a few days ago when uh, the uh, dgp up in fact mentioned he said the islam that i grew up with for the majority of my life and which is now which i which is what i grew up with and this is what he is saying i am not competent to to comment on that he said it's completely different from what he says is islam being practiced or preached in the mosque today in up he says it's alien to him from what what that was the islam which is and that is one again aspect which is coming in the in the salafi wahhabi uh, trend of islam that you are not you are not having islam always had dialogue you know uh, people express different views etc and there was multiplicity of ideas and thoughts in islam which is again getting narrowed down in certain pockets and so that narrowing down of pockets itself and making sure that only what i say is right everybody else who has a different view is wrong is what i said again on the radicalization is the one keystone of freedom of expression and thought which you are now <coughs> restricting and therefore that is a, again a sign of what we will call the radicalization etc i'll mention one and then i'll come to a few uh, elements of the counter radical uh, counter radical strategies because i know there's going to be great detailed discussion so i won't get into the details will i have the opportunity also to speak i'm one chair in one of the sessions we again talk in one sense of what is called hindutva the hindu right now 
The Hindu right in one sense has a right to express their views. Nobody has to deny that. And I think what, what we are really in one sense only concerned about is if you express your right in such a way that you don't, what I said was, don't lead to violence, don't, read, don't lead to restricting freedom of thought. Because in our constitution, we have our safeguards and so on and so forth. And I think uh, the Chief Justice of India was, I think, extremely, uh, I think, a very apt statement which he made. He said, you don't have to worry about the courts who are going to protect everybody, including the rights of the minorities. Uh, the, the rule of law will prevail in India. He said, the courts will ensure that. Courts alone will not ensure that because public opinion, public uh, activity right across the spectrum, across communities is essential in one sense to mold uh, public opinion. If you look at uh, the, on the countering radicalization and I think one of the key elements is what I would call as a strong state and the rule of law. Wherever you don't have a state which has collapsed, which you've seen that all over the Middle East, which is happening, or in, uh, in Libya and Somalia and so on and so forth, ground for extremism comes in. And the rule of law. Rule of law is two ways. It's not just the rule of law which favors, in one sense, the rich. But I remember what uh, when uh, we were discussing left-wing extremism in the Home Ministry and so on and so forth, a rule of law which makes sure that grievances of the people are effectively redressed as fast as possible at the local, local levels. And we have a lot to learn in that. It's one of the reasons for this frustration, this grievance which pushes people towards violence is again because your grievance redressal mechanisms are not effective enough, not fast enough. And if, you're, if it doesn't, and that, that, that is why the attention to detail is so important. And I keep telling administrators that, you know, people say administration is, you know, anybody can do, it's a generalist first. It's actually a very professional service in, in its own right because of the way the administrative bureaucracy itself is. Just to give you one example, the Chhattisgarh government, as part of, we said, we found out there were over a lakh cases in Chhattisgarh against the tribals for violation of various provisions of the Minor Forest Produce Act. So the tribals will pick some berries and they'll say it's a violation of section so and so of the Forest Act and the case is booked against them and they have to go to the court and local municipal or local magistrate, you know how the courts will send them 10 adjournments, 30 adjournments, they waste one day going to the court, coming back, it's a day's employment lost. Great persuasion that Chhattisgarh government finally said we'll withdraw all cases, one lakh, a government order is issued, copy sent to the MHA, they are all very pleased. We just by abundant caution, I actually asked the um, CRPF people, etc., who are, because now the, you had people all over the place, I said, please go and find out what is happening in the ground. Six months later, we found that hardly anything had moved on the ground. And that is again partly because what happens is that those orders have to issue from the state government have then to go to the districts, the district collectors. From the district collectors, it has to go to these APPs and the special prosecutors. The special prosecutors have to then go and file a petition in the court saying that government has asked these cases to be withdrawn and you can only withdraw it after the magistrate gives you permission to withdraw it. Now, if you don't, any one of these steps, and we found in half the states, the order of the government had not reached the collectors. Some of them, and from collectors, it had not reached the special prosecutors. And some of them, the special prosecutor is lying in his table. He has not gone and filed a petition in the court. So if you don't follow all this procedure, you will take a decision which is very fair, but actual grievance redressal on the ground, the, the tribal is still again going month after month to the court, wasting his one day's wages and getting frustrated over the whole exercise. I mentioned the fact on, on the family and the community, which are now critical. And in fact, in the in the Home Ministry, what I understand, that is in fact where uh, the whole uh, 
focus of all attention is now on the community and the community leaders and on the family. If you try to get that bond and that dialogue going, you will find that uh, the element of radicalization leading to, because today you cannot stop people from having access to radical thought. It's, it's an open society, any amount of... You have prisons, which is again now the focus in the Home Ministry as prisons as a breeding ground for violence, violent extremism, and therefore people have tried We've not succeeded in either whether you want to keep the violent prisoners who are with these radical thoughts separate from the others, or if you form, keep them separate, then there's another uh, issue which comes up, and what type of pr uh, process will you do to make sure that those who are there with... And very difficult, and all over the world, the field studies have shown across the world that de-radicalization, in spite of months, years, psychiatric counselling, etc., once you've got very highly committed, you rarely, it's only about less than 5 to 10 percent of people who actually get, uh, shall I say, de-radicalised. The others are who, are who are still on the, what I call as haven't gone to violence, haven't gone to that other extreme, it's much more easier to do it. And what is important in, Indi in India today is also to do what I call as the empirical studies. We don't have enough empirical studies on why people join, why people come to this particular this thing. What are the causes? What is the age group? What is the profile? Who has been the peer group? How long does it take for somebody to get into the system? And unless you have a lot of these field studies, we are going by what I call as just, you know, my intuition, uh, somebody is in the field, I, I interrogate three people, they tell me something, right, wrong, I don't know, is that, can I make it across the board? And because these studies are not there, and I think possibly for the IDSA, it's a, it could be a very useful uh, aspect to study some of these things in very great detail. Because if you see even just one simple example I'll just give you of uh, where some people are doing, is in prisoners itself, under trial prisoners. Now we know the under trial prisoners are, very large number of them are from the Muslim community and from the scheduled tribes and scheduled castes. I'm not looking at whether, but a study done in, I think it was Musafar Nagar, uh, showed there are 3,000 prisoners there, under trial. I'm talking only under trial prisoners. And bulk of them, you would think that they are being tried for terrorist offences or other things, etc., which is not the case. They're actually being on offences are under the so-called orders of the UP government, under the Arms Act, you can't have more than a six-inch dagger. So if you, have, if you are in possession of a six-inch dagger, you are booked. You have not committed any violent act at all, but, and many a time people say that these daggers are actually planted on us, so there are, there are stories of, you know, how the, uh, some police stations had a whole briefcase full of these uh, six-inch daggers and so on and so forth. Then again, drugs. And there's one more, I, I forget. These are three cases under which these 3,000 prisoners in one jail, I'm talking about one jail, 3,000 under trial prisoners are actually being, and they are not able to get bail because of, and what people come as the legal uh, uh, aid, and this is again what I call as the studies which are required. People say, look, you're not able to get bail, you're not, there's a whole, magistrates are not giving bail, etc. Why don't you, when the legal aid societies come, uh, accept the offence and you are out. Because they're not getting bail. Many of them, because they have lack of knowledge, they say, parents are saying, you know, and so on and so forth, so they accept. Then what happens is that you have now become a convict. You are convicted of the offence and then you have got out. And when you get caught a second time, or if you want to put it that way, even if you are framed a second time, then you are now, makes it much more difficult for you to, because you are already got a guilty verdict against you, which you have agreed to on your own. Now these are the type of, I am just, I am only putting it in the context of what I call as grievance redressal and how the grievance redressal, frustration, the rule of law, 
your sense of injustice, if that is not looked at, you will then find it's a breeding ground for radicalization of the level which I am doing. And wherever we have found that we are able to provide the grievance redressal mechanisms, reach out to the people and then say that we are able to solve your problems, you will find a sea change in the material. And that is where the key element of our counter radicalization study is across the board. It's not something which any one agency can do. It's agencies which all of us have to do, both as citizens of India. I'll have to ask, how many Muslim friends do you have? How many of uh, the Hindus will actually, how many of Muslim friends are invited to your house for socialization and so on and so forth? What was the position 10 years ago and what are the position now? Is there a difference and so on? Are some things, questions which we have to ask of ourselves? Are we also, in, in one sense, getting ghettoized into our own social uh, packets? And this is something which is happening in Facebook. Because Facebook uh, studies have now very clearly shown that you have a group, 40 people, 100 people, whatever it is, all of them are of the same view of thought. They may be pro-liberal, anti-this, anti-that, whatever it is, but they're all of the same thought. And people who are in that group who are not, of, shall I say, of that view, they're actually thrown out. What you call unfriend you. You're not a friend anymore, you're unfriend. And then you're kicked out. And therefore, you are you get thoughts, you get articles, you get uh, opinions, you get this thing, everything which reinforces your own thought. So you think that you are right. Because 100 other people in the group all support, you, you express an opinion, everybody says very great opinion. It may be prejudiced, it may be, and therefore it is. And therefore, use of the social media, which is very critical, and I'm sure there's a, there's a big session on that, is extremely critical. Because both Facebook and Twitter are now, Google itself, are now into this whole aspect of looking straight away into this. And I think you've seen President Obama's statement that he's going to actually ask Silicon Valley to find the software which will be able to identify the key uh, thought processes in, uh, in the radical uh, ideologies and have them equally removed almost on a simultaneous better. You put it up and it, you have these keywords in those which are inciting to hatred, to violence, etc. And your website will just automatically be deleted as you put it up. So you, even though they've said 120,000 websites have been deleted, but uh, we know that any number of websites can be put up daily. So it's a continuous battle which will have to be fought both on the technological front and others. So it is something which is for all of us in one sense to deal with. It's not something which, and every single action of ours that we take, which promotes communal and harmony, which promotes the sense of justice, which promotes the rule of law, is in one sense going to contribute to increasing security for India. I'll stop here. Thank you very much.